Distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, Director General of NSAR Foundation, Director General of Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum, Assistant Director General of CESRIC, Representative of Distinguished Institutions, Distinguished Professors, Experts, Resource Persons, Speakers, Administrative Staff, Organizing Committee, Students, all protocol duly observed. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and privilege for us to welcome you on behalf of the Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum to the OIC Intern Vision Training Program currently taking place in this um, embellished amphitheater hall of the Ansar VACFI headquarters. We would like to express our deep appreciation and our gratitude to OIC Intern and CESRIC and ICYF for their unwavering and endless support in facilitating the organization of this training program. We would also like to thank Ensau Foundation for hosting this event with their invaluable logistical support and their splendid facilities. Before moving on, uh, allow me to confess something. When Ms. Amal brought me uh, the program yesterday in the office and she said you are going to be MC, uh, when I read it will take place in Ensar, Vakfi Foundation, I thought it was actually Vakif Bank. So I was telling her, I didn't read properly, so I just told her, okay, I'll be there, but I have a game tonight. I'm going to play football. She was like, no, don't play football because you might not be in the program today. I said, no, nothing would happen to me. She's like, no, your brothers might hurt you on the field. So in my mind, I thought it was Vakif Bank. So the whole time I was like, why are we organizing an event in Vakif Bank? So alhamdulillah, this morning, <laughs> when I was coming, I read the program and I noticed it's a different venue. So I wanted to confess about that. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to us to reiterate that OIC Intern is an international internship program that aims to guide young people in their professional career planning by reinforcing the academic knowledge gained in university education with practical application. Thus. OIC Intern Vision is a platform in which students can project themselves within a codified framework. As we all know, the current situation in our respective regions are alarming and youth nowadays are affected by the burgeoning rate of un unemployment. That is why there is an urge to redefine the trainings our youth are receiving and we need to train them within the conformity of our current context. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the program of today shall flow as follows. First and foremost, we shall have a series of welcoming remarks by our honorable guests. Thereafter, we shall proceed to the first panel discussion of the day, which shall focus on youth career building pathways in media, humanitarian issues, and volunteerism. The second panel shall focus on youth vision and awareness towards entrepreneurship and capacity building. The last panel shall be on youth, civic, and social engagement. After the first panel discussion, we shall have a lunch break and also a prayer break. Afterwards, we shall continue with the other panels. It is worth mentioning that each panel session shall be conducted under the auspices of a moderator. Last but not the least, we shall have a family photo. Ladies and gentlemen, as announced, and without further ado, we would like to invite Mr. Hussein Qadar, Director General of Ensar Foundation, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Mr. Director General, the stage is yours. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kıymetli misafirlerimiz, değerli öğrenci arkadaşlarımız, öncelikle programımıza hoş geldiniz, sefalar getirdiniz. Uluslararası Staj Ofisi OIC Inton Gençlik Vizyon Eğitimine hoş geldiniz diyor. Sizleri sevgi ve saygılarımla ve değerli misafirlerimiz selamlıyorum. OIC Inton Gençlik Vizyon Eğitiminin Türkiye'nin dış politikasını, kariyer planlama ve geliştirme, girişimcilik ve toplumsal etkileşim gibi hususlarda Gençlerimize aydınlanma, sağlayarak bir eğitim olmasını temenni ediyorum. 2017 yılı Kasım ayında Başbakan Yardımcımız olan Hakan Çavuşoğlu ve Eski Milli Eğitim Bakanımız İsmet Yılmaz'ın ve T3 Vakfı Kurucusu ve Başkanı Selçuk Bayraktar 
Genel Kurul üyemiz Bilal Erdoğan Bey'in ve iş dünyasından, bilim dünyasından birçok kıymetli insanın katıldığı bir lansman gerçekleştirdik. OIC Inton Uluslararası Staj Ofisimizin kurum ve stajyer başvurularını lansman itibariyle başlattık ve 115 farklı ülkeden 5488 gencimiz bizlere başvurularını yaptılar. Ofis ekibimiz deyimi yerinde ise çok emek verdi. Online ve yüz yüze Türkçe ve İngilizce, Arapça, Fransızca mülakatlar yaparak kurumların ve öğrencilerin taleplerine uygun görülen 521 öğrencimiz kurumlarda staj yapmaya hak kazandılar ve o kurumlara yerleştirildiler. Bugün Türkiye'mizin yakaladığı her profesyonel aynı zamanda kültürel tecrübeyi birebir kendi ülkesine, yaşadığı ve piştiği şehre, topluma ve mahallesine aktaracak 521 tane gencimiz var. Ve sayıları gün geçtikçe artacak. Bu misyonla bizler Ensar Vakfı olarak üzerine düşen her türlü göreve hazır olduk ve daima hazırız. İnanıyorum ki yarının yollarında attığımız bu adımlar edebi ve hayayı kuşanmış bu gençlerimizle birlikte daha kuvvet bulacaktır. Ayrıca bu programımızın paydaşları olan İslam İşbirliği Teşkilatı, SESLİK, Yurt Dışı Türkler Başkanlığı, Türkiye Odalar ve Borsalar Birliği ve ICYF, aynı zamanda programda çözüm ortaklarımız olan UDF, Müsiada ve Mental Danışmanlık Şirketi'ne ve önümüzdeki üç panelde yer alacak tüm değerli konuşmacılarımıza katkılarından dolayı şükranlarımı sunuyorum. Uluslararası Staj Ofisi, OIC İntönü'nün en verimli sonuçlar sağlaması ve Müslüman coğrafyalarda yetişen gençlerimizin önemli çalışmalarına katkılar, kapılar açmasını temenni ediyor. Teşriflerinizden dolayı ve katılımınızdan dolayı hepinize ayrı ayrı teşekkür ediyorum. Tekrar hoş geldiniz, safalar getirdiniz. Thank you very much, Mr. Director General. Uh, I was asking Anes if the speech was finished because I recently moved to Turkey and I don't really understand Turkish. So he was trying to translate, but we couldn't get along. But I think from what I heard and the few words I heard from the Director General, I think he was welcoming us and saying, those of you who, is, who did not come to this program, tell your friends that they are missing out on a good event today. Now, let us invite the Director General of ICYF, Mr. Yunus, Director General of Cabinet, sorry, of ICYF, Mr. Yunus Sonmez, to give his opening remarks. Mr. Director General, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, respected representative, representatives of institutions, uh, dear panelists and uh, speakers, and uh, there are, I know, some representatives of consulates and uh, embassies here, uh, the representatives of consulates and embassies, and our dear participants, the most valuable part, uh, the person in the pro persons in the program. Uh, welcome again to this uh, program. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. On behalf of Islamic Cooperation Youth Forum, I wish all you a warm welcome to this illustrious place. And I would like to express my thanks and gratitude for the Ansar Foundation for hosting the, the opening ceremony of OIC Youth Vision Program. As OIC affiliated organ, IC, ICYF will continue to do its utmost best to implement the various programs, initiatives and activities for youth in the Muslim world and to advocate youth interests, develop youth capacities and skills, all these with understanding that they need to understand their rich legacy of Islamic tradition. The ICYF can and should certainly do more for the future Muslim youth. However, for that to happen effectively, more support from the OIC member states is needed in order to ensure that together we can achieve much bigger success on youth empowerment without oversight of course, the rich Islamic tradition and values deeply rooted all across the OIC region. As you may already know, ICYF places great, atten great attention on youth leadership and capacity building. It continually pursues, pursues ways and means to convey them to all categories of youth age, including very young age groups. Over the past few years, ICYF has made significant efforts towards building the bridges of peace and solidarity through uniting the aspirations of young people, especially when they were able to come together and exchange interaction, learning and training. On that, we believe 
we have made laudable efforts towards the implementation of youth activities. It is worth mentioning that the OIC intern is one of those many crucial initiatives we have started. The foundations of the program were first taken in 2010 with the implementation of the internship for international students studying in Turkey under the Islamic Countries Vocational Education Cooperation Program, OIC with shortly we say. The OIC in turn is not designed to a pure internship program. Through various trainings and consultancy services during the internship, trainees are expected to gain leadership, entrepreneurship and communications. I believe all our friends who are attending this program will have opportunity to discuss among themselves as well their experiences together. Uh, I don't know if all of you know each other. In general, uh, I believe there were some opportunities that to meet uh, among uh, our interns. For the, for the year of 2019 and 2020, and specifically for the spring term, we have received 1,342 student applications. 76 of them already have started their internship. Since 2018, OIC intern project was, was collaborated across, across 42 companies, including 18 private companies, 8 public institutions, 11 NGOs, and 5, five universities. And we believe this number is going to raise in coming years and coming terms. One of the purposes of this program is to gather young people from across the OIC region irrespective of their background or affiliation in order to set a framework for peace of, for all. Needless to mention that we have succeeded to draw the attention of many institutions as we received many invitations to conduct such programs in many institutions and universities together from several OIC member states to such ex an extent for implementation. On a related note, as you are aware, the Muslim world has reached economic and social capital and can therefore play a major role in the world affairs today. For example, it has 70% of the world oil resources and nearly 50% of the world natural resources, in addition to its 45% of world agricultural land and well-developed river systems for irrigation. However, the average European per capita income is 24,000 uh, US dollars, when it is below 10,000 US dollars in the Muslim countries. It is even unfortunate that Muslim world represented, uh, represents, represents only 5% of the world GDP. So what is the main source of this? We have all the sources, land, and all the, uh, how can I say, required materials, but we don't have a well-trained uh, population, especially youth population. And which is actually, we have the youth population in, uh, when you compare with the West and the other countries in general, uh, Muslim world has the most dynamic youth population in the world. And what we only need to do is to energize these uh, sources and then activate these sources and then, inshallah, we can develop a better future. Youth population in the OIC geography needs to further empowered and enhanced as the main driver of strength in the region. Many other regions currently have faced serious demographic declines. When the OIC region, by 2050, youth population is projected to be nearly one-third of the total population. This population stratum, uh, stratum however, faced several issues. While described in the first report of the state of youth in OIC member states, jointly prepared by the ISWF and our partner, partner institution, CESTRIC, this includes, for instance, education, training, employment, and entrepreneurship, cultural and value change, uh, political, civil participation, and health and mental health. And recently, we were discussing in ICYF uh, uh, Islamophobia and its effects on the uh, mental health of the Muslim youth in general, which is now becoming a serious problem among the non-Muslim uh, countries youth population uh, in Muslim youth population. The social environment and the economic pillars of the sustainable development require more inno innovative approach of implementations so as to reach out the widest worldwide audience. Our main priority as implementers of the sustainable development agenda for 2030 focuses on quality education, environment, economic growth, peaceful and inclusive societies, gender equality, and other aspects of sus su uh, sustainable development which also cut cross with the OIC youth, strategy, youth, OIC youth strategy. 
While reiterating my profound thanks to all of our dear participants, I pray to Allah, the Almighty, to grant us all, all success in our new programs and projects, which will certainly serve the youth of Ummah effectively. I wish you uh, every success in this program, hoping it will, it will meet and even exceed the desired expectations. I thank you for your kind attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Yunus. And lastly, we would like to invite Mr. Fadi Farasin, Assistant Director General of CESRIC, to deliver his speech. The stage is all yours. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies, gentlemen, uh, dear participants, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. At the outset, please allow me to convey the warm greetings of our Director General, uh, His Excellency Mr. Nabil Dabur, who could not be with us today due to pre-arrangement uh, uh, commitments. So I am delivering the welcoming speech on his behalf. Uh, I am very pleased to join you at the program uh, on youth with a vision which is taking place with the framework of the OIC intern program, a program that was initiated by CESREC two years ago. I want to express my gratitude to ICYF and uh, Ansar Foundation uh, for the organization of this important event and for Mr. Taha Ayhan, the president of ICYF, for the kind invitation. The OIC member states as a group are a privileged group with a wide range of resources and potentials. On top of these resources and potentials, it's human resources. The OIC member states compose one quarter of the world total population. The OIC population is young, with more than half of the population uh, uh, co uh, consisting of youth under the age of 24. This young population, known in the literature as the youth bulge, could unleash tremendous economic and social growth. Unfortunately, in many OIC member states, this potential is unfulfilled due to a number of challenges facing youth. One of the most pressing challenges is youth unemployment. 14% of youth in OIC member states are unemployed, well above the world average. What is striking about this youth unemployment is the fact that it is highest among the most educated segments of the youth population, the ones holding a university degree, reaching around 50%, more than half, in some OIC member states. Complicating the unemployment scene further is the fact that the overall entrepreneurship ecosystem for youth is not very much enabling in many of our member countries. This, is, this stems from factors like limited access to finance, social norms, and the prevalence of the uh, informal economy. Widespread youth unemployment in particular can serve as a driving force for instability and political and social upheaval as seen in a number of OIC member countries in the so-called Arab Spring. Widespread youth unemployment can also serve as a catalyst for radicalism and conflict two Malays plaguing a number of OIC countries. Another challenge facing youth lies in the domain of education. Many young people in the OIC are still illiterate. About 18% of youth in OIC member countries are unable to read or write. Even the youth who receive education, they are not receiving the right kind of education. Sestrek analysis shows that there is a serious skill mismatch in OIC member states indicating that the education and skills the youth are equipped with are not the ones needed by the labor market. The under-education and skill mismatch are producing youth who are less productive because they do not have the required level of skills, and as such, they add less value to the employer and to the economy in general. But a more critical challenge facing youth is their lack of participation in the civic life in many OIC member states. On average, youth participation in civic life in OIC remains relatively limited compared with other country groups. Youth alienation, political instabilities, ongoing conflicts, traditional ageist perspectives, and limited development of civil society organization are among the main drivers and manifestation of the limited participation, youth, uh, participation of youth in the social and political lives. Ladies and gentlemen, the economic, social, and political dimensions of youth and empowerment are highly interlinked. 
Governments are therefore advised to recognize the importance of adopting a multidimensional approach to addressing the challenges faced by youth. On the economic front, OIC countries need to improve youth access to employment, education, and training. In particular, youth must be given access to programs tailored to their needs and to the needs of the labor market. On the political front, new policies and initiatives should be taken and geared towards enabling greater youth participation in political and socio-economic decisions, with a view to rebuilding trust between youth and public institutions. Furthermore, addressing the challenges faced by youth should not be left to governments alone. Governments, private sector, NGOs, and youth themselves should work as partners. Dear participants, addressing the challenges faced by youth is among the top priorities of CESREC. Uh, as one of the earliest established subsidiaries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, mandated to work in the domains of statistics, socio-economic research, and training, CESREC has been contributing actively to the efforts of the OIC and its member states towards enhancing intra-OIC cooperation and overcoming challenges faced by youth and empowering them. In the area of statistics, CESREC database OIC stat includes more than 750 indicators under 24 categories. Out of these indicators, 15 of them are reported under the category of youth. In the area of research, CESREC has been preparing a regular report titled State of Youth Report in OIC Member States. We submit this report as the main technical background document for the ministerial conferences of youth and sports minister in the three official languages of the OIC. The most recent edition of this report will be submitted to the upcoming Fifth Islamic Conference of Youth and Sports Ministers that will be held in March 2020 in Jeddah, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In addition to its technical research reports, CISIC also prepared the OIC Youth Strategy in cooperation with the OIC General Secretariat and ICYF. And this youth strategy has been adopted during the Fourth Islamic Conference of Youth and sports ministers that was held in 2018 in Baku. In the area of training and technical cooperation, we as CESREC give special importance to training and capacity building activities in the domain of youth empowerment. Allow me to provide you just a few examples. As CESREC, we are the executing body of the BINA program in partnership with the Islamic Development Bank and the Libyan Program for Reintegration and Development with a view to supporting the national efforts of Libya towards fulfilling socio-economic restoration. Within the framework of this program, an SME incubator has been established to support the development of SMEs and startups for entrepreneurs, including youth, by providing them with the advisory, technical, and administrative support services. To offer young university students from the OIC member state the opportunity to get professional experience before graduation, CESREC initiated an internship program through this program, young students get hands-on hands -on experience and learn about the job environment. Additionally, two years ago, CESREC initiated the OIC International Internship Program, OIC Intern, with the involvement of prominent partners, partners uh, which are uh, Ansar Foundation, uh, TOP, uh, YETP, and ICYF. The program provides opportunity to the university students from the OIC member states to pursue their internship in selected companies and institutions. The OIC internship program started as a pilot project in Turkey. But moving forward, our goal is to scale up this program and uh, to spread it to other OIC member countries. We are proud that this program has become a success story and has contributed significantly to the knowledge and skills of the young people has facilitated their transition to the labor market and contributed to the improvement of the quality of the labor force. SOSREC also launched a training program for junior diplomats in 2017. This program provides junior diplomats from the OIC member states an opportunity to enrich their knowledge and develop their skills on various issues of concern to the OIC diplomatic community. Dear participants, the member states under the umbrella of the OIC have reached an important conjecture in the domain of youth empowerment over the last decades. In this domain, the convening, or the convening of four ministerial level conferences, the adoption of the OIC youth strategy, and the establishment of ICYF 
as an affiliated institution are amongst the major achievements in the OIC level. It is also important to underline that the OIC Youth Survey 2019, which was prepared and conducted by CESREC, pointed out that there is a positive momentum towards the implementation of the OIC Youth Strategy. Nevertheless, more efforts need to be exerted by the OIC member states to effectively address mounting challenges which is faced by the youth. In this picture, the intra-OIC cooperation could play a catalyst role as the OIC member states have various experiences, best practices, and success stories towards youth empowerment. In this spirit, I would like to assure you that at CESREC, we will continue our efforts towards empowerment of youth in the OIC member states through various activities and programs and different cooperation modalities. I wish you all the success in this program and thank you for your kind attention. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Fadi. Before we kick off the panel discussion of today, I was told to invite a special guest here on stage for a short performance. Um, he's known for his poetic recitation and his poem shall be centered on peace and on Turkey. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Mr. Adam Abubakat from Nigeria. I begin with the salutations of Angel and First Nation, a piece of negotiation to open the line of communication, and that is Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I'm happy to meet you all here. My name is Zadam Al Bakr. I came to Turkey uh, since 2010. I finished my high school here and my bachelor degree. Now I'm doing my MA in Ibn Khaldun University. Uh, my poems are in Turkish, so... İsmim Adem Ebu Bekir, aslen nijeraliyim, şahsen kayseriliyim. Dolayısıyla kültürüm Anadolu, her yanım sevgi dolu, işte bu bir lük yolu, yaşasın Türkiye'm. Türkiye'de güneş doğar, rengarenk kültürle doğar, Dünyaya ışık tutar, yaşasın Türkiye'm. Üç yanı deniz saran, üç kıtayı bağlayan, işte bu cennet vatan, yaşasın Türkiye'm. Karadeniz, Akdeniz, Marmara Egeliyiz, işte bu vatan bizim, yaşasın Türkiye'm. Şehitlerin can vatanı, Müslümanların hayranı, mazlumların kahramanı, yaşasın Türkiye'm. Çağlayan ırmakların, uzanan sıra dağların, yemyeşil ovaların yaşasın Türkiye'm. Mehmetçiğin olgusu, düşmanların kabusu, işte Osmanlı ordusu yaşasın Türkiye'm. Hadi Türkler el ele, Kürtler lazlar kol kola, Çerkez Arap yan yana yaşasın Türkiye'm. Canım kurban uğruna, meydan okuruz düşmana, basamaz hain toprağına yaşasın Türkiye'm. Barış Sesleri adından uh, the, uh, the Voice of Peace adında bir şiir yazmaya çalıştım. Gelin canlar, gelin birleşirelim elleri. Bugün barış için çalışsın sazın telleri. Sokak sokak yükselsin barış sesleri. Gelin barış için birleşirelim elleri. Bir bahardır barış, çiçektir simgesi. Bir aşktır barış, ana yüreğidir ülkesi. Bir ağaçtır barış, birliktir meybesi. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Ne geziyor toplar, tüfekler bu alemde. Her geçen gün çocuklar acı içinde. Filistin'de, Suriye'de ve Yemen'de. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Her yanımız oldu kan revan. Bitmeyen gözyaşlarımız arakan. Asla vazgeçmeyeceğiz Doğu Türkistan. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Nerede merhamet, nerede neferleri, ağaçlar, kuşlar, 
Doğanın tüm renkleri hepsi elden gidiyor. Nerede sevenleri? Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Ak güvercin özgürdür barış diyarında. Asla ırçılık yoktur mukaddes kitabında. Her millete yer vardır bu çınar altında. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Bu cennet vatanda barış sesleri. Toprağında barış. Bu cennet vatanda barış sesleri. Tarihinde barış, toprağında izleri, kültüründe barış, türkülerinde ezgileri. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Benim mazlumun gönlünü okşayan, ben ana, ben baba, ben Fatihi Cihan, haykırır dünya ismimi, ben Barış Han. Gelin barış için birleştirelim elleri. Teşekkür ediyorum. Çok teşekkür ederim. <laughs> um, this again is a testimony of how important uh, learning different languages is good for each and every one of us because it creates a proximity within ourselves and the other people. And this is the beauty of the Ummah, which most of us are not uh, ignoring. And I happen to be a product of the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Uh, we were studying in Malaysia, and today I'm proud to see Mr. Anas here, who is my brother, and Mr. Adam. And I would like to thank also my mentor, Dr. Fadila, who was mentoring me during my university days in, in, univer in, in IUM. So Turkey has provided that space for us to serve the Ummah. I remember when Mr. Anas was telling me five years ago in the university, Edi, I hope one day you will come to Turkey and we'll do something for the Ummah. I told him, brother, I got to go back also and help my people. I went back and 2020, if someone had told me in 2020 I'll be in Turkey, I'll not believe. But this is me, I'm here and I'm happy I'm serving the Ummah. So it's important for both local and international students here studying in Turkey to make use of this, get to know each other. Today, my roommate, with whom I spent five years in university, Hamza, I think he's in, working with in Ibn Khaldun. He listens to African music more than me even. He even tells me when a new album is out, he tells me, Idi, did you listen to this? I taught him, but he's now better off than me because we created that proximity. So it's very important. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the ongoing panel discussion shall be under the auspices of the moderator. This first panel discussion shall focus on youth and career building pathways in media, humanitarian issues, and volunteerism. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Yunus Sonmez, Director General of Cabinet of ICYF, who will conduct this session. Mr. Yunus, the stage is all yours. Okay, the fun part starts now, <laughs> after all these uh, protocol speeches and everything. Uh, I have three uh, valuable guests, young people, successful people who are experts on their fields. And uh, as you can understand from our topic, it's uh, career building pathways in media, humanitarian issues, and volunteerism. We have media experts here and humanitarian and volunteerism experts here. Uh, I will give the floor one by one to them. But uh, before that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Mr. Uh, Tariq Sharkawi, uh, he is manager at the TRT World uh, Research Center. Dr. Sharkawi is an executive with a career that spans a range of industries, including the creative industries, higher education, and think tank industry. He holds a PhD in media and communication studies from Auckland University of Technology. He contributed to dozens of articles and chapters, authored and co edited uh, several books and reports including the news media at war, the clash, uh, the clash of Western and Arab networks in the Middle East. His research interests include the international broadcasting, media, public diplomacy, media framing, and media military relations, specifically within a Middle Eastern context. And uh, we will have uh, Mr. Salman Salim Keskin. Uh, he is the head of the Turkish Red Crescent's humanitarian research team. He has completed his PhD in 2017 at Gazi University with his dissertation on international migration policy. 
Previously, he has worked as a research fellow at Gaza University and Oxford University. His articles appear on migration studies, humanitarianism, and public policy at several international media outlets, such as Anadolu Agency Analysis, Bruyere, and 1868. And uh, I think youngest member of our panel is Mr. Adam Ben Said, is a strategist for TRT World, an investigative journalist. He is also the managing partner of Stratton Consulting Group. Formerly, he served as a senior manager in my institution, ICYF, and chief of strategic officer for Maven uh, Company. Welcome again, and thank you for coming and joining us today. Thank you. Uh, we have two media specialists, one uh, humanitarian <laughs> side. So uh, if you don't mind, I would like to start with the humanitarian side first, and then uh, the ads are going to come, okay. the media part is going to come. So before we come here, uh, before this session, we were sitting downstairs for kind of like uh, preparation, and we were talking about the uh, world condition uh, and how the things are going. Unfortunately, I'm in the pessimistic side of the, uh, how can I say, it? pessimistic side of the uh, people or pessimistic side of the uh, kind of academicians. I'm also kind of semi-academician, still struggling with, with PhD. Uh, it seems like we will have much more need for the new humanitarian assistance experts in coming years, and we will need some much more media experts who are going to uh, shed light on many issues, crises in uh, especially this part of the world, it seems like that. And uh, I don't want to make it long, I would like to give the floor to uh, <coughs> Mr. Salman, and the floor is yours. Thank Mr. you, Salman. thank you, Yunus Bey, salamu alaikum. Dear friends, welcome uh, in this good morning. Uh, I would like to thank the organizations, so organizer, organizer of that OIC intern program, Sestrik and Sarwakfi, Yeteb and Top, and thank you all. My voice is okay? Okay, I think that's better now. So uh, my topic uh, is on the humanitarian studies. I, I would like to give you a, a brief uh, st story of the humanitarian studies and uh, want to encourage you to, to, to focus and to study in, in this area. Before starting my presentation, I would like to know you more, actually. Is anyone in this room has ever worked as a volunteer in, in a humanitarian organization? Okay, 10. Anyone made some homework or some researcher write dissertation or paper on humanitarian or humanitarian related uh, studies? Okay, what is your topic? Not studies, but I was working with uh, Red Crescent in Turkey here. Okay. I was like, this one, the representative of this one, International okay. Unity. How about Red your Crescent. topic? What's, what was your focus on? I'm working on the NGOs that work in, in the African region. Okay. In one, there was some other. How about your topic? Yeah. Okay, how about you? Refugees, okay. So today I would like to give a the picture on humanitarianism to you. Humanitarian as a career path, humanitarian as, as a research area, and humanitarian as a uh, area of volunteerism. And when we look at the news, when we look at the, the, the media outlets, when we look at the papers, always we have a new crisis, a new developments, new disaster uh, in, in different contexts of the, the globe. And humanitarianism becomes a more and more uh, evolving working area and uh, more important area in media, in, in political science, in sociology, in, in engineering, in law, and etc. But as the OIC countries, our expertise and our human capital uh, in this area is not uh, improved so well. When we look at the news, we always see um, OIC countries as a subject of the humanitarian discussions. Okay, there's a crisis in Syria, there's a famine in Yemen, there's a disaster, and etc. Always uh, we have news and we have papers, reports related to OIC countries and humanitarian discussions, but always we are the, the, the, the subject of uh, these discussions. We are not designer of humanitarian programs, we are not uh, Founder of the humanitarian programs, we usually we are subject and we are beneficiaries of the, these humanitarian programs. Today, I would like to encourage you to focus 
this area, this uh, this field in your in your career path. Before uh, starting, <coughs> I would like to provide you some basic statistics. You can find more statistics in the reports, but uh, just to give you a picture, when we look at the, the UN OCHA, the, the Office of Humanitarian Coordination Office, so more sorry, than... Sorry for interruption. If you want, you can uh, come here, if yeah, you can see yeah, better. Yeah. So when we look at almost 200 uh, of the world population are humanitarian need. This means these people are, are not leaving their homes. They need, their, uh, they, they need humanitarian projects for their basic needs, such as shelter, education, and protection, and etc. Plus, around uh, a billion people in the world, uh, one out of nine people are, does, cannot get enough food for their daily, daily life. They, that's a huge number. Plus, we see uh, around 80 million people in the world are forced to flee their homes for disasters, for climate change reasons, or for conflict, or for wars. Uh, almost 30 million of these people are forced to flee their countries also. They are not living in their countries, they are under the protection of uh, other countries. You can, as, as I told you, you can find more detailed statistics based on the, the locations, based on the geography, based on the sector. But just to draw a picture in your mind, uh, almost one out of nine people in, in the world needs the humanitarian assistance. These people need help from the others. They are, uh, they are lack of their, their basic needs. From this regard, uh, we can name the humanitarianism as a, the most important ism uh, in, in our uh, age, actually. The communism, liberalism, capitalism, there are a lot of isms, but when we look at the human, humanitarian perspective, when we look at from our conscience perspective, let's say the humanitarianism is the, the most important ism to follow uh, and uh, to, to, be, to, be, to be fun of. But there are different definitions, different modalities of humanitarian activities. That's why we should ask, what is the humanitarianism? Who are the humanitarians? And why sh we should be uh, interested in humanitarian uh, sector? And how we can be the humanitarian? And what is the, t the, the correct and proper time for the humanitarian activities? And I will provide you a brief answer for these uh, questions. Uh, because uh, when we look at the news, <coughs> For example, when the, the United States uh, occupied the Iraq after the United States, US aid also followed the uh, United States. That's why the humanitarian organizations and political organizations usually uh, sometimes can move together uh, and political intentions and humanitarian intentions usually intersect. What is the relation between them? Every action, every organization who distributes foods are not the humanitarian organization. That's why uh, what makes a people humanitarian. What makes an organization humanitarian? It is the answer that a belief in improving people's life and reducing suffering. If the main motivation of an organization of a person is improving people's life, just the people's life, not based on their religion, their ethnicity, their uh, political ideology, just a person. Just people, a person needs help just because he is a person uh, and reducing his suffering. This is the main motivation of the humanitarian, humanitarianism. And who, who is the humanitarian from that perspective? A person who is involved in an organization or in a campaign or in an activity which, is, which aims to improve people's life and reduce the, the suffering. And another definition is concerned with or seeking to promote human welfare. <coughs> Why we should be interested in the humanitarian uh, activities? As I told you, it is the, from my perspective, it is the most important ism uh, of the, our current age. And uh, the, the, another reason, uh, if I'm not wrong, this is the, the, the, the quotes of the Malcolm X. What are you doing for the others? Okay, we are in our daily activities. We have another, a lot of activities. We are going to school, we are eating, we are getting to know each, each others, we, we, ha we are uh, doing a lot of activities, but all of, our, all of these activities are for our personal career, for our family, for our uh, personal life, and what we are doing for the others. And it is, 
Uh, it's the main question which motives me to do humanitarian studies, actually. Uh, what you are doing for the other people, what you are doing for your neighbor, what you are doing for your friends, what you are doing for your colleagues, what you are doing for the people in, in the planet. And uh, the answer of that question uh, actually makes us uh, humanitarian. And how you can be humanitarian? Uh, what, what are the modalities of the humanitarian activities? When you look at the literature, there are d different definitions and there are different uh, classifications, but humanity, impartiality, and neutrality and independence are the main uh, principles of the humanitarian action. It means you should make your humanitarian activities just aiming your, your, your uh, just aiming beneficiaries the human, human humanistic perspective and you should not be part of the, the conflict and you should be independent of the politics and you should be neutral to the beneficiaries you can you cannot classify them based classify them based on their identity their religion or their another uh, ideas and according to red crescent and red cross uh, movement principles volunteer service unity and universality are the other uh, principles of the humanitarian action. You know the news and you, you, you watch the, the, the, the news, there are a lot of crises in the world, but when you look at the maps, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a common pattern here. Most of the crises, most of the humanitarian problems in the world occurs in the OIC, OIC countries. And this uh, is a, this, this picture gives us a huge responsibility as a as the future, as a um, as a leaders of the, the OIC content, as a leaders of the UMA, We should focus on our own problems. Usually, when we look at the humanitarian agenda and humanitarian activities in these locations, the projects, the problems are designed in Geneva, designed in Brussels, designed in New York, and implemented in, in these countries. And as a future of uh, the OIC, um, OIC countries, we should have the lead to solve our own problems. When we look at the 1950s, remember your uh, IR classes, the World War II, there was a huge humanitarian crisis in, in Europe. There was a European refugees in, in Iraq. There, there was European refugees in Syria. And there was a huge crisis and huge uh, human movement, uh, huge, huge forced migration from Germany, from Poland, and from other European countries. And European countries has solved that problem uh, within their internal power. And this, uh, when, um, when, when we look at that, that history, uh, the, the, the history gives us a huge responsibility to solve our, to solve our problems, humanitarian problems. <coughs> And I don't want to take you too much time, but uh, just to give a picture for the, uh, for the, for the people who are interested in the research uh, side of the humanitarian activities. We have traditional charity-related activities, mainly based on the, the religional uh, motivations. But in the, in, the modern times, in the modern times, we have different themes of humanitarian uh, activities, especially with, uh, in the 1860s, the modern humanitarian ideology, humanitarian understanding has started with the Geneva Conventions, with the starting of the Red Cross movement. And uh, fr from that point until 1950s, humanitarianism uh, usually <coughs> understanding as in, in the war zones, in the we should help the people, we should help the uh, people who are affected in, in, in the wars, especially think about the World War One. But after 2050s, after the end of the uh, World War Two, the humanitarian activities and humanitarian organizations has changed considerably. And in the Cold War One, uh, Cold War time, and in the post-Cold War time, there was a more urban urbanization of humanitarian activities. Humanitarian organizations focused on the urban related problems more. And especially in the uh, 11th September, humanitarian activities usually focused on the Islamic countries and they also have another political uh, motivation. We can discuss these issues with the uh, question, Q a session maybe. When we look at the humanitarian ecosystem, there are four types of the humanitarian organizations. The, the United Nations system, the, the World Food Program, United Nations High Commissioner for the Refugees, uh, International Organization for Migration, and United Nations Development Program, and UNICEF are the main humanitarian organizations in the UN system. And most of the humanitarian activities are occurred in, in, the, in, in the mandate of the United Nations organizations. 
maybe founder or maybe implementer uh, partners. Apart from the United Nations uh, system, we have big international organizations such as Oxfam, CHAIR, MSF, you should have known, uh, Norwegian Refugee Council, Save the Children, IRC, and we have uh, the, the long list of these organizations, but these ones are the usual suspects of the humanitarian uh, international organizations. Apart from that uh, international NGOs, we have Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, which as a Turkish Red Crescent, we are the member of that organization and big member of that organization. And our president is vice president of the uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, which uh, uh, has its HQ in Geneva, and these, this moment in every country there is one Red Cross organization or Red Crescent organizations. Usually in the in the OIC countries we have uh, Red Crescent, but in some uh, Muslim countries we have Red Cross organizations, but in every uh, member of United Nations we have one Red Cross or Red Crescent movements. They are usually <coughs> based on the volunteer activities and they are their countries, national societies, and they have a role uh, in their services to their public administrations and an auxiliary role to the public administrations. And they have in contact with their public administrations, but they are independent from the, the states. And we have NGOs, the most important part of uh, humanitarian system, the local NGOs, the local ones, the grassroots organizations. When we look at the uh, United Nations and international organizations and even the, the, the Red Cross and Red Crescent movements, they are in the top level of the humanitarian sector. But real life and real problems occur in the local level, as we guess. Uh, according to last report published by ALNAP, which is a humanitarian think tank, there are almost 500,000 humanitarian professionals in the world. And around 100,000 of them are working with the United Nations system, and uh, 50,000 50, of them are working with the international organizations, and the plus the, the, the, the rest of them are working with the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, and the local NGOs. And it gives us a huge picture. Most of the humanitarian activities, most of the humanitarian efforts are in, in, these, in the local level, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent level and the, in the NGO level. That's why most of, but, but most of the budgets, most of the projects are in the upper level of the organizations. The, the money and the, the mind and the logic of the humanitarian activities are in the United Nations and international levels but the real humanitarian activities are in the, in, the, in the grassroots. And this is also a contradictionary picture for us uh, to, to, uh, to, to make better. What are the main fields of the humanitarian acti uh, actions? Uh, when we look at the humanitarian <coughs> analysis, humanitarian activities, humanitarian pictures, usually we see one guy is distributing a food package to the another one. And there's a, the picture of humanitarian activities, but, but the distribution of food packages is just the easiest and the simplest parts of the humanitarian activities. That's why we should uh, focus the, the, the, the background of these humanitarian, humanitarian uh, activities. Uh, there, are, there is a cluster system in the uh, UN humanitarian agenda, which means if there is a disaster, of this, if there is a humanitarian crisis, there should be these clusters and the members of these clusters should coordinate themselves. This system doesn't work very well, but that's an ideal system. And uh, I would like to uh, emphasize these clusters too. There's a communication cluster, which means providing communication for, for, the, for the people and providing communication for the, uh, for the humanitarian organizations. And food security cluster, if there is a humanitarian problem there, you should ensure the food security in the area. And shelter, accommodation issue, you can provide the tents or you can provide other uh, kind of shelter actions. And transportation and nutrition and protection of child, protection of women, protection of vulnerable people and education. And if there is a disaster there, you should ensure the continuity of the education there. If there is a mass movement, you should, uh, uh, you should ensure education opportunities for the children. For, for the children. And uh, wash, uh, sanitation and hygiene activities, which, which means the, uh, the wash, uh, wash cluster. And health. 
in every humanitarian context, in every humanitarian problems, these clusters are the main clusters and there should be uh, an organization, there should be an, a people, there should be an agency to, to deal with these problems. If one of these uh, clusters, one of these sectors have underestimated it means there will be a problem. For example, you should focus on the education-related activities, but if you don't have enough shelter facilities there, the, the, the education projects will not work very well. That's why they are interrelated. They, they have their uh, in independent uh, bodies, but they are quite in interdependent. <coughs> Mr. Selman, uh, can you wrap up? Okay, okay. As a, as a future, uh, in, in your future career opportunities, you can have different careers in, in the humanitarian organizations. I will not uh, go to go to details, but in every sector, in every uh, work path, you can find a humanitarian, humanitarian ver version of them. Administration, fundraising, engineering, law, science, and etc. And in every, uh, job, you can have a humanitarian content, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian version of uh, your work. As a research researcher, as in your master's dissertations, in your homeworks, you can focus on the conflict studies, the climate change problems, the technology, the, the, the future of humanitarianism, the big data and health technology issues, and finance and the politics and the health uh, issues are the main research areas for the humanitarian studies. And uh, apart from that, you can choose your, your career path in the human, humanitarian sector or your research path in the humanitarian sector, but always you have an opportunity uh, to be a volunteer in the humanitarian sector uh, in, your, in your professional life or in your educational life. And there is a UN volunteer platform. I think most of you are aware of that platform. And there are volunteering opportunities in the, the Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent movements. And there is a European youth portal. You can, uh, you can choose your uh, volunteering opportunities there. And in the Turkish context, we have, oh, there's a typo there. Turkish Red Crescent Youth Services. I will give you my the communication details uh, to, to, to, to make you in touch with the uh, volunteering ac your activities. And what, if you ask yourself, what can I do for the others personally? What can I do uh, in the humanitarian context? You can make the donation or charity in, in material context, but you can work as a volunteer there, or you can uh, build your career in the, in the, in the hum humanitarian sector, or you can create a path in your research agenda in the humanitarian items, and you can use your skills for the reducing the suffer of the other people, actually. And I'm coming back to the, my question, what are you doing for the others? Life's most important question for me, and, uh, and it should be an, the most important qu question for us also, and to reduce the suffering of the others uh, is the meaning of the humanitarian, actually. And this is my communication details. If you have any the questions or other, uh, uh, other comments for our future interactions, I will be happy to be in touch with you. Thank you for the, uh, the, for the panel. Thank you for the organization. And thank you for the <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Selman. It is uh, actually Dr. Selman gave us the general picture of what is humanitarian work on the field in general. He will be here after the session. Who would like to? I mean, this is an opportunity. Who want, would like to contact with him? Definitely, uh, exactly. person. I'll, I'll he can, they can come and talk with them. Now, I would like to turn to our second panelist, uh, Dr. Sharkavi, and he is going to uh, talk about uh, media and research part of the uh, field. And I would like to give the floor, Mr. Shah. Thank you very much. Well, assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here uh, among you today. Uh, it's, uh, I would like to thank the organi organizers for the invitation. Uh, actually, I think it is a very important uh, opportunity for youth, uh, especially young graduates and uh, people uh, like, uh, like yourselves who are embarking in this journey of uh, education, higher education, tertiary education, to uh, know what you want to do after uh, graduating and, and seek pathways and seek uh, uh, pathways to be leaders in, in, in your field. So this is for me an opportunity to communicate some of the aspects that are related to my line of work. Uh, we, I work for TRT World Research Center. For those who don't know, TRT World is the English-speaking broadcaster of Turkey. 
it's a public broadcaster. Uh, the opportunity that has been created is, is very important for Turkey because for a long time, uh, the voice of Turkey was lost in the international arena. The, the, the Turkish people, Turkish politicians were very good at addressing the local uh, audience, but this uh, uh, communication was lacking when it comes to the international audiences. And I can see from the, from the audience here that there are people from many parts of the world, from Africa, from Asia, from uh, parts of Europe, from uh, other, other places, so this is great. Um, there have been a, a major revolution in media. If you, if you, if you take uh, the five last centuries, we are now in the fifth uh, revol media revolution. The first happened 500 years ago with the invention of the print, uh, Gutenberg. He invented the printing machine, and from there we had like a, a, a big jump uh, in, in, in media production. So the last one is with the one that we are living is the, the, the ICT revolution, uh, information technology, media technology that is happening right now. It has been uh, around for the last 15, 20 years. So this has created a lot of opportunities, but it has also created a lot of challenges. What are, th what are some of the opportunities? The opportunities is we are living in a, med in a, in a media-socked environment. Everybody can communicate to everybody. Everybody basically is a media uh, star, can be a media star. Everybody can put a viral communication, be, uh, have a channel on YouTube, be somebody who is known. Uh, give his, his ideas, his impressions to a, a, a wide audience. So this is something that is already happening. This has also some, in, in some optimistic views, that uh, there is now more accountability from some governments around the world that because people know, people communicate, you can say your opinion. So this puts a little bit of pressure, puts the governments and elites in power around the world in, in a kind of spotlight. So these are some of the opportunities that are brought, but there are also some challenges, big challenges. So what are some of the challenges, for example? We are living uh, also in a, a, an era since 2016, which I would, uh, I, would, I would say that the last four years, we are living in an information disorder uh, uh, era. Uh, lots of fake news. People can fabricate news and, and circulate news and, and create problems. Uh, I mean, we are talking about humanitarian problems. For example, in India, we have seen mob uh, lynching uh, people just because some fake news or some WhatsApp that somebody has killed kids or somebody has done something which is not even proven or corroborated, but people jump into conclusions and do a lot of uh, uh, uh, problems, a lot of, a lot of crimes actually are happening, massive crimes are happening on the ground. So these are some of the, uh, some of the issues, but there are also issues for uh, let's say policy making. We, there have been studies around that uh, a lot of now uh, policy making around the world is, is driven by media rather than being driven by the actual need for, for certain policies. So, med so some, some uh, governments, actually majority of governments, are actually responsive more to the media uh, constraints than actually creating the policy from, from, from a need basis uh, uh, re reality. So this, this is, has changed a lot of dynamics. It has uh, changed a lot of uh, uh, situations because, uh, because uh, for example, uh, just to give you a certain, uh, certain examples, uh, for example, during the Blair era, uh, uh, Tony Blair, that is the former UK uh, prime minister, his, his government issued something like 32,000 uh, press releases. Uh, if you, if you, I, during four years, which means you have at least 21 a day, every day, to, uh, to follow. So if you want to really uh, study policy making, research on the policy making on certain situations, you'll be overloaded. There is so much going on, there's so much being uh, uh, produced from the government that like any researcher would be lost, there would be huge pile, uh, piles of, uh, of documentation, it's going to create problems. So these are some of the challenges that, that, uh, that we are facing. As Media organizations also we are facing many challenges. Uh, the thing about the research center I'm representing, the TRT World Research Center, it's, it's a problem because we are not totally media, which means we are not journalists, we are not creating uh, buzz and, and, and feeding like, uh, new stories and trying to uh, create short, uh, short pieces of information. We are more on the research side. 
So it creates like a, a certain peculiarity. We are in the middle of both worlds. We are at the same time academics, but we are not totally academics. So our products are not like exactly like uh, an academic product, like for example, a long essays of like, or like a dissertation of 50 pages. So we have to be mindful of the, the kind of situation we are operating in. We are operating for media and uh, in the uh, intersection between media and uh, and academia, so we are in the in the, in that intersection, in in the in the middle between both these worlds. So this creates some pressure on us because we have to be fast. We have to act like media because, there are, for example, we have this cor uh, coronavirus. Okay, so the journalists will be, and I'm sure my my colleague here, Adam, will be uh, talking about uh, some of these aspects. So my colleagues are already on this. So they have to produce something fast, they have to, uh, to, to talk to the audience, uh, write to the audience, uh, prepare some videos about it to the audience. Uh, what is this virus? What does it create? Is it dangerous? Is it contagious? Is it all that? So that side they will take care of. Okay, what do we do as a research uh, center? We have to be deeper than this. We cannot just uh, scratch the surface and say why, who, when, all this, the, the, the five W's. We have to go more than this. So it means that we have to, for example, we have to consider the uh, economic impact of this. Is it good or bad? Is it, is it going to hit Turkey, for example, or Turkey would be beneficiary of this? So I, we have to do it fast because a lot of people are waiting for this, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, kind of um, um, intellectual production. Our senior management will be expecting something. The, the, the, the, if we don't talk about it within one week, this subject will probably will be covered by others. So it creates also a, a, a pressure on us to, to be fast, but at the same time to be thorough. So this kind of balance between both the media need and the academic need creates uh, extra uh, dimensions of, of pressure on, on, on, on people like us, research centers, and, and, and the likes. It, you might ask this question, why a research center in a media uh, organization? Well, we are not the first to, uh, to, to put this, uh, this format. Uh, if you check, Al Jazeera has uh, a center of studies. Reuters have their own institute of journalism. Uh, NHK, which is the, the Japanese uh, public broadcaster, have also an institute on, uh, on media production. So this, this format exists, and it, it, it aims to actually create more depth for the newsroom. Uh, I don't know if you know that, and I hope some of you guys will be able to uh, find some opportunities to train within newsrooms. But the, the newsroom is very fast, it's hectic. You have to produce things very fast. It's, uh, it's 24 hours 7. They don't operate like this 8 to 5 format. It's like, you know, you can work like this shift this week is like, uh, I don't know, uh, 12 o'clock uh, to 8 o'clock in the morning, and next week is something else. So it's a lot of. Uh, a lot of adrenaline, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, fast, rapid kind of uh, environment that is uh, taking place. But at the same time, from our side, so if you, if you go and do this kind of uh, internships or, or, uh, or uh, have like a kind of uh, fellowship with, uh, with a newsroom, you will see how things are moving really, really fast. But that fast aspect, we cannot, we cannot um, we cannot make it uh, an impact on, on the intellectual production. We have to be fast, but at the same time, we have to be thorough. So it means we have to have, as well, a lot of background. So this is why, uh, just some words of advice, try to be, as students, try to have uh, focus. Don't, not, don't just be generalist about everything. You, you need to have some focus in your research area. So for example, if you are, uh, if you are doing uh, uh, like a research on, uh, uh, let's say, on terrorism, try to be specific on a certain region. Uh, like for example, terrorism in uh, Syria, terrorism in Iraq. Don't be like too generalistic because this doesn't help really uh, when you come to this kind of uh, environments like, like ours. Uh, uh, we, we need people who have already some, uh, some, uh, some depth because, as I explained, we are fast, but at the same time we have to uh, provide some, some, some depth. So the research center we are operating in has uh, five areas of, uh, of research interest. So because we cannot do uh, everything, and this is something that you have to be aware of, uh, there is this saying in, uh, in English, I don't know if you know it, but uh, jack of all trades master of none. If you try to do everything, you'll end up mastering nothing. 
So this is why you have to have focus. This is something I would really recommend for my, uh, my, my, my fellow attendants here, is to have focus on some areas. And, and for ourselves, our, our center, we focus on five areas. So the first one is Turkish foreign policy. So anything that, that is dealing with uh, foreign policy impact on Turkey, we will be very uh, uh, giving a close, a close uh, monitoring to, to that area and try to uh, publish more on, on it. Uh, the second aspect that we are uh, monitoring closely is uh, security, security studies. So human, from human security to uh, physical security, like terrorism, other, th other things. So this is the second area that we are uh, uh, um, uh, specialized in. The third is uh, uh, migration and uh, all these uh, refugees, I refugee issues, asylum, uh, uh, diaspora, all, all these movements. So we are uh, uh, giving, allocating close attention to, to that uh, research uh, area. The fourth is media and communication. So being part of uh, a media organization, we also are uh, monitoring what's happening in the media field, whether in whether. The, the, the digital uh, transformations and all that, which I'm sure my colleague will touch a little bit on, uh, or uh, about like let's say certain ways of uh, representation. Like for example, if we, we we say Turkish elections, how is the Turkish election being represented in international media? So we will have a research done over there, and we will try to find out more about it. So this is uh, our fourth and uh, last but not least, uh, we have. Uh, uh, also, we allocate some uh, uh, some interest to uh, so which one I said I said uh, so security studies migration uh, media and communication Turkish foreign policy Islamophobia and uh, all xenophobia all racism uh, we have also a very keen interest in studying uh, this this phenomenon so now what are some of the challenges we are encountering in terms of having new recruits. So I want to talk to you frankly Can and wrap up with this? yes, I will wrap up with this. So when we have new recruits like yourselves, we would like ideally when somebody is applying for let's say for this kind of uh, positions, we will look not just at oh I have a master's degree or have a PhD on this, this is fine, this is fantastic, but this is just the beginning of the road. We will have a close look into what other additional skills you have. So for example, uh, we need a lot of data. Uh, so if you have uh, knowledge of certain software like R, Python, Strata, all this data software that, that helps us in grasping the, the numbers and crunching them and, and coming up with some uh, good recommendations. The other things we, we also want to see is, is excellent writing skills. We don't have the time to give you a new education from scratch, so please guys, when, well, as you are studying, try to have, if you are good, uh, you are doing your studies in English, try to have excellent English, excellent writing English skills. And the problem is, I'll tell you, it's not just simple English. It has to be very, very sophisticated because this is research. We are dealing with a lot of serious things. So uh, all this beginner kind of mod um, intermediate will not cut it. So, so that's, that's one. And last but not least is the attitude. We have a problems with, uh, I, I will be very frank, with the new generation. They have very high expectations. They think they are the stars. They own the world. The reality is it doesn't work like that. There are tasks. You have to be flexible. You have to be adaptable. We have events. Somebody can have a PhD, but he still will have to do an event and run it from A to Z. So uh, they have to be mindful of that. They have to be open with that. You have to have a certain attitude that is you know, a, winner, a winner attitude, leadership attitude, because at the end, you'll benefit as well from that. So these are my words for now, and I'm open to questions later Thank on. you. Thank you. Such a lovely. It was a valuable contribution. And I saw the challenge of being an academician and uh, dealing with also news, these fast moving, fast is uh, news issues. It's really a huge challenge, since academicians are like mostly uh, feeling like how to say more slow time exactly. periods, more longer time periods. It's like working in such an environment should be like challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I go to the, our last panelist, I would like to say at the end of the Mr. Adams uh, panel, I mean speech, we will have a question and answers part. 
and we will take by uh, you are going to raise your hands and we I mean we will uh, select and you can ask your questions and now the floor is Mr. Adams. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I want to start by commenting on Dr. Tariq's uh, last uh, few points. I actually work in the same institution as Dr. Tariq in uh, TRT and uh, he's absolutely right in that the workplace nowadays, the modern workplace is fast paced, it's demanding and um, a lot of what they teach you in school generally doesn't prepare you for that. And it's not just excellent communication skills or writing skills that you should be investing in from now. It's also the capacity to create ideas. And that's probably one of the most important things that you need to invest in from now. On your personal time, and this is something that cannot be taught, it has to be learned on your own. Um, I'm Adam Ben Saeed. I, um, as the brother mentioned, I used to work in ICYF as a senior manager before. Before that, I was working in CESREC, and I'm actually a product of the OIC intern system, so to speak, before there was an OIC intern. So I interned in Jeddah in the political bureau uh, for a few months before I went on to join CESREC. I learned from excellent researchers such as Mr. Fadi himself at the time, and we were exposed to so much in terms of uh, quantitative and qualitative research in industry and economy and water and security, health, agriculture, all these fields, you're just immersed in it and you have to learn how to swim. And as he said, there's no time for you to learn a new education on the job, it's figure it out on the fly. You have a day, two days grace period and then bismillah. Um, in ICYF as well, with the programs that we had to develop, you needed to leverage your understanding and your education of whatever, if you studied sociology or politics or psychology, with the demands of the job. So I have to develop a program to meet a specific objective that's critical thinking, that's strategy making, that's impact, and above all, it's efficiency. Um, and I feel like this is not really communicated often in, in the field, but I'm not here to talk to you about that. That's just a side comment. Uh, briefly, I want to talk to you about um, employment or generally the role of youth in economies in this digital era. And I feel that a lot of this is traditional. Uh, what we hear usually about uh, youth need to upskill themselves or invest in soft skills and the like. This is taken for granted, no doubt. But I want to talk to you a bit about the trends and the necessities that you as youth will face in the next 10 to 20 to 30 years. So we already realize there's a digital disruption within economies and it's not only for businesses and media organizations, but it also very much affects societies and then cultural change. And you have only to look around you to see the examples of this. I don't need to go into it. But it brings with it significant opportunity. And what I have to emphasize to you now is that you need to get in touch with, very briefly, um, the developments and the trends that are happening around you right now in order for, by the time you graduate, to be at least familiar with them. And I'm talking here about artificial intelligence. You have opportunities to take coding. And, and although Dr. Tadaf emphasized you cannot be a jack of all trades and a master of none, at the very least, you do need to have um, a multidisciplinary background. Not only does it increase your uh, hiring capabilities, your, your hiring prospects, so to speak, but at the least you can do a better job at it. And to be, sp to be specific here, statistics and big data are a big thing, as Dr. Tadaf mentioned, in nearly any, any job, but also the capacity for public policy decision making, and I feel the majority of the room here um, are people that are international relations, am I right, am I wrong? That was a question. Uh, how many of us here are IR students and graduates? Sociology, psychology, social, science, social sciences, yeah. let's say, generally. Yeah. Okay, a any sciences, engineering, STEM? Fair distribution, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I'm actually happy to hear that. I was worried that it would be like a political science meetup, you know? Um, so there is a necessity for you to get engaged with a lot of new skills because when you enter the world of media, for instance, not only are you demanded to write Adam investigative journalist report in 50 minutes, but also, when there's a creative session, I'm demanded to create ideas about new digital contents that haven't been imagined yet, whether they're interactives or new kinds of shows or combinations of different ideas. I'm required to be able to read data and analyze trends and numbers at the same time. In the policy level, I'm, be, I'm, I'm demanded actually to produce programs that create a genuine impact. And it all comes back to two things, which are added value and efficiency. Um, a lot of the volunteerism that we do in universities are, is done for the sake of volunteerism and, and that's simply it. Uh, that's what they teach us. Okay, good job, pat on the back, you volunteered, you had a great activity, that's great. But if we're talking about sustainable change, uh, meaningful, systemic, 
development. Um, it's not enough to have an event where you bring people together, we shake hands and then we go home. You have to think in the long term, you have to think about changing structures and all that. And I know with the youth, there is this passion to do that, but often they ask themselves, how can this actually be achieved? The thing is, nobody's gonna tell you how, you have to figure it out for yourself. And that comes through years of education and experience and whatnot, but you do need the background knowledges of at least management, efficiency, planning, and this comes from your own personal initiative. So when you see these opportunities, um, take it. When it comes to digital economies and, and, and digital markets and, and digital technologies, um, a lot of the things that we expect from governments are actually, a lot of the things we expect from governments are actually burdens on the youth today sitting here in this room. And I'll give you the most basic example of it. We discuss a lot the idea of, uh, let's say, shared economies. We all know that the EU began as a shared uh, market before it morphed into a regional structure. But I need to be real with you, a lot of the uh, government narratives and rhetoric about empowering youth are only about giving you the tools to actually go forward and do it for yourself. So when we speak about regional economies and transnational economies and regional collectives, um, digital disruption that's happening right now, such as like online markets, are actually in a better place of achieving this um, than governments ever were, ever before. And we have to realize the times we live in now are very significant as well. Um, if you go back just a hundred years, somebody would live in a city, die in a city or a village, and they would never leave it. And they could not imagine that life itself would change over the next 50 to 60 years. They would hear about changes from far. But now we're immersed in constant dynamic change, constant upheavals, whether it's with the coronavirus and its implications, whether it's foreign policy movements and the rest of it. So if I ask you, how do you see the world in 50 years or your place in 50 years, you probably don't have an answer. And it's very difficult. But that very capacity for forecasting, for looking ahead, is something that we need to inculcate because within the Muslim world generally, um, I feel like we are excellent organizers. We can strategize as well, but when it comes to execution, we fall off the, we fall off the boat there, if, if I may. And this is something, again, the burden falls on you as a generation to look at the table. What are the challenges that are facing the Muslim world? You can hit up Cesric's website, read the reports, the very comprehensive, detailed reports that will tell you exactly where we are in every single industry, every single field, and make your own conclusions because these are not things that you'll be educated about. Um, you have to look at the trends within the spheres of, of employment and again ask yourself, who will I be? And this is again something that, unless you have a career counseling um, units within universities, nobody will sit you down and say, um, who do you want to be? Um, I'm a political scientist by background, but I work in product development, data, strategy. I branched out. Mr. Fadi can conduct research and oversee research in almost any field, quant quant qualitative or quantitative terrorism expert, Islamophobia, in addition to the fact that he was, by background, an industrial engineer. Yet he has significant management experience. And all these successful case studies are essentially fusions of experience, of hard work, and as Dr. Tarek mentioned, a absolute, you gotta rip out the entitlements. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. So my advice to you essentially is to master your craft and master it well, and to fail hard and fail early. Uh, because when you fail at a later stage in your career, there's no coming back from that possibly. And if you're in the humanitarian sector, that can mean lives. If you're in education, that's ruined generations. Um, and to take it seriously and do it for the right reasons. Um, nobody will really tell you this, but there's a lot of barakah and blessing and ikhlas to do it for the right reasons, for God, for service and public service and kindness to your fellow man. And in this generation of optics and social media, it's very easy to get swept away by um, I will be the next president and I'm going to take this selfie with that president and therefore I have accomplished something by proxy. No, your accomplishments are with God only. Um, maybe it's necessary to share this, but at the same time, keep yourself real and keep yourself true to yourself as well. It's not about the people or who's seeing it, it's about you. And if you ever feel that in your heart, and this is as a brother to brothers and sisters here, if you ever feel in your heart that I'm enjoying the spotlight or I'm doing this for the fame, or that it, that's the wrong reason, get out. You need to clean your heart first. Um, our religion is a religion of seeking of knowledge. Our Prophet, Prophet Sallallahu said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. So your journey has only begun in truth. It doesn't end with graduation. It doesn't end with your first job or your fourth or your fifth. You have to adopt the mentality of consistent, continuous growth in keeping with the times and above all the needs of the Ummah. 
And we are, as I said, in an incredible moment of transformation. 40, 50 years ago, the changes that we sought, our ancestors sought, um, were not possible, whether regionally, politically, economically, but now for the first time, it's possible. And you have to think also in the bigger picture here of the Muslim world, because it's not just about the nation state or my community or my culture, it's about humanity as well, not just even the Muslim world, civilization. Um, a lot of the things that we're trying to achieve, strategically speaking, if we don't do them now, we'll never be able to do them in the future. And I'm talking about artificial intelligence and even quantum technology and certain infrastructure that once developed elsewhere, you can't, you can't catch up. You're, we've been playing catch up for a while. And again, with these disruptive technologies, it's possible for someone such as yourself to make a significant difference. So think sustainably, think about impact, and think above, above all about giving back. And uh, that's genuinely all I have to say to you. Thank you. Adam. Thank you, Mr. Adam. Uh, Mr. Adam gave us a general roadmap for your coming years, which is valuable, I think, for all of you. And now I would like to open the floor for questions and answers, Q&A session. So let's start from my right and lead ladies, please. Yeah, uh, Mike, do we have? Coming, here, please. And I think we have to restrict this in 15 minutes because there will be a lunch and prayer session. Salah, so yes. Uh, firstly, please, could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ryan. I'm from uh, north of Iraq. And I have uh, two questions for Dr. Tariq. Uh, you said about the research. If you did anything, uh, opportunity for teaching research for students, uh, uh, the first question. The second question, why you didn't focus it in Iraq? We are in Iraq, didn't have anything to teaching researchers for students. We have to learn, we have to research to grow up, to grow up of the uh, development or uh, government or uh, society or ummah. So uh, I suggest you uh, to uh, opening uh, something for youth uh, of Iraq to, for example, uh, university student or high school or master degree student, it doesn't matter. Just do something to teaching the Iraqi people to researching. Thank you very much. Okay, if uh, our panelists agree with me, I will take some questions first and then I will give you the floor to you. Okay, we can continue with some other questions. Let's, yes, another lady there. Assalamu uh, alaikum, Nauris from Tunisia. Uh, actually, I have a question uh, that may be answered by the three of your highnesses. Uh, we're talking about researchers here. So, yes, it is so important, but without, without applying these uh, researchers, without uh, getting out these words from paper and apply it on real, real, reality, uh, we, yani, we can do nothing. So, I want to have some numbers, examples of some researchers that are applied in reality. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone from this block? Okay, last, we can give this back to you. Yeah. No, no, sir. this gentleman, yes. And then we are going to finish the first uh, group and we will come to answers again. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm doing master's in peace and conflict studies at the Social Science University of Ankara. I'm from Somalia. Uh, my question to you was like, I'm highly interested in TRT, Al Jazeera Center for Studies. That's why I'm focusing a lot about my research studies and these stuff. Do I have to be part of TRT in order to publish there? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's now turn to the panelists, if you want to answer some of them, and then we will continue some, with some other questions. I, I want to answer the question about the usefulness of research. Um, someone once told me that, I think it's like 99% of research is not even read. I'm going to be frank with you. Mm -hmm. um, but the, in, in the ecosystem of research, not to demoralize you, there is academic research, which is just for the sake of academic research and citations, and there's an economy there going on. And then there's academic research that seeks to make a change. If you're serious about not just researching some facets or sub phenomena, genuinely uh, giving back with public impact, your research will be read. There are think tanks. Think tanks are read by policymakers. There are research institutions such as CESRIC that do research <coughs> with policy recommendations. And nowadays, um, it's not just about 
policy. It's about public policy recommendations based on data so that we have informed um, change. So all these are different ecosystems that may suit you, and you need to look at the intersection and the interaction between all of them, including, let's say, for instance, TRT Research Center, which is also a media-related. There's, there's a few out there. Um, that's not to say that research is not read. It is read if it's good research, essentially. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm completely agree with my brother. Just, just an extension. For example, STRC, we are an organization of implementation, and we are not an organization of research. But our research, research department conducts some impact analysis of the projects, and, and we, we can modify uh, the project according to these results. And this can be just an example for your question. Yeah, if I might add for the same, I mean, there are two categories of uh, research when it deals with policy making. Is it the first one is for policy making, so research for pol policy making, and then there is research on policy making. So sometimes the policy makers themselves, they approach a certain center because they want to know how to deal with a certain issue. So I can, I can certify that at that stage it will be read and, and if the research is good it will be implemented. But if it's about how uh, or on how the policy making has been conducted or some some aspects of that it depends on the rece receptiveness and the, the willingness of the institutions to to listen uh, to other voices to the lady from iraq uh, you know to be to be honest uh, we have a, we have certain programs to embed um, people like researchers from all around the world we have this fellowship program uh, last, uh, last, uh, the last uh, occurrence of this uh, program, we had the 33 people from different, uh, different places that come to TRT World in general. Some of them were part of TRT World Research Center. We trained them on how to uh, do research that is, uh, that is according to the parameters and criteria of, uh, of a think tank. Iraq, of course, is in our hearts. I, I, we, did, we did a lot of research also on Iraq. We hope to see more. Maybe we can collaborate with institutions in Iraq in the future. For now, this, uh, these are not, they, we didn't receive any kind of uh, ap uh, approach or any uh, uh, request for collaboration. If we do, we certainly will consider. Okay. I will go now to this part of this uh, <coughs> room and uh, let's see yes, the lady there. Please. Hello, my name is Zalfat Abdillah. I'm from Comoros. I would like to thank all of you for this program. I have two questions, one for the uh, humanitarianism. Uh, you, have all, you have already explained, how, explained us how it's going on in the world, and my first question will be, will be uh, despite all this collective money and charities, why do the world still need, uh, there is so many people in need. Is it because uh, the collected money or charities are not enough, or is it because it's not used in the good way? My second question will be in the, um, for the media. Uh, in in these um, speeches, we always talk about being fast, being fast in this field. So uh, you have already explained to us with this internet and everything, we have many fake news. And we don't know which one is true or, or fake. So is it not because everyone wants to be fast, to be the first one to release any news that we have many <coughs> fake news in, in our, I don't know, in, in this time? So I'm really, I'm very curious to know if it's being fast or being true. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the back side. Is there any? Okay, here we have a gentleman. Yes, please, on your right. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Shamil. I, I'm studying political science uh, in, at Shehir University. Uh, my question is for uh, Salman, Mr. Salman. Uh, you talked about being volunteer and uh, pursuing career in humanitarianism. How do we differentiate them? Like, that's, that's my question. Let's go back to there. The, the, let's go back to the back side because they, are, they have been waiting for a while. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Uh, this is Leo Rama from Sri Lanka. Oh yeah. So what is the OIC stand for non-listed country like Sri Lanka or Myanmar? Okay. Right? 
So it's my first question. Uh, second question is, uh, in OIC list, Syria. Syria is suspended. Why? So according to the Dr. Salman, so he's talk about the humanitarian. So, right, Doctor? So okay. in your list, Syria is in their necessity. Why is suspended? I just checked the Google, and it says that Syria suspended. Why? OK, for the OIC questions, in the coming panels, we have, we have some uh, people who has really good experience in the OIC structure. So we can keep it for the next panels, if it is OK for you. Because there are really good experts on this issue. They can uh, answer on all these questions. So if you don't mind, I mean, we will focus on some other issues that our panelists are mostly related. Uh, who else do we have there? And there is one gentleman here. Can we just give the mic here? And the last one, there is a lady here uh, from the beginning. She was just uh, asking for the, yes. Thanks to all. Uh, my name is Sayyid Makfur. Uh, I am doing master's program in Istanbul University, Department from Islamic Finance. I have a question uh, to Mr. Tarek. Uh, already uh, my uh, Commodore sisters already mentioned about the fake news. I just uh, also, I, I came from Bangladesh uh, as well. So we have a big problem about this uh, concern. So uh, I just uh, want to know about the what should be f policy making uh, we are need to minimize this uh, f f f system. So uh, this is my question. OK, because of time limit, I have to take the last one question. With <coughs> here, there is a lady asking for permission. Yes. Hi, I'm Dima. Uh, I'm a student uh, logistic management and as transportation, I'm from Iraq. My question is for Mr. Tarek. He said uh, for the students who are still studying and they will graduate nearly. So uh, can you please again highlight what they should do to get good opportunities? And uh, that my second question is for uh, your highness is uh, uh, about charity, you said we need to make charity. There's an idea, uh, don't give me a fish but learn me how to catch this fish or something like that. So is it, al is it always f uh, charity good or we should uh, g give more opportunities to learn them how to work or how to get uh, anything uh, by working, not just by uh, giving them uh, the thing. Because uh, I've watched a video uh, recently, they are saying it's charity is not always a good thing for uh, society. Society. Okay. society. Because of our, our time limit, I have to finish the questions here. I would like to give the floor to the panelists, and you will have more opportunity after the session. Uh, I mean, one by one, you can come and ask the questions to the, our panelists. Yes, the floor is yours. Before you go, you have to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So why there are still so many problems despite all the humanitarian efforts? Actually, let's say. Uh, there's a long answer for that question. I'm not sure if there is a correct answer or not, but uh, the crises are evolving from different locations to, to the another locations. That's another, uh, that, that's, that's one of the reason for that. The, there are, <coughs> there's a problem uh, of misconduct uh, on the field. There, there, there's a problem of lack of coordination, lack of e effectiveness of the humanitarian assistance. Uh, and d despite, Big efforts, the impact of these programs are not uh, too big. This can be a, a reason for that. But there are also some good, good developments in, this, in the same areas. We are not uh, discussing the same humanitarian problems which we have in, in the beginning of the 1990s, which we have in the, in the 20s. That's why um, the, I will still work in there are another crisis and another, another problems in the uh, different uh, um, location of the world. And there is a problem of the application of the projects uh, on the field. The, the, the same different organizations implementing similar programs to the, to the same uh, beneficiaries. Uh, this is also another uh, problem on the field. And we don't have too much time. What's the difference between the pursuing a career and be becoming a volunteer? And you can make, we can earn money uh, in a humanitarian organization. This is a pursuing a career. And but you can do another work. You can have your own business. You can work in other places. But you can use use your skills in the humanitarian sectors. If you are a designer, you can work 
uh, for a design communication department for a humanitarian organization. And by, or maybe you can work in the communication department. Uh, that's the main uh, difference. Actually, as a volunteer, we can use all of our skills, or, or for all skills, there's a humanitarian, uh, humanitarian counterpart. For example, one of my friends who is a doctor who told me, okay, oh, I, I want to volunteer for the Turkish Red Crescent, and I want to, to carry some boxes to the poor. I, I told her, no, you have more expertise on, on the med med medical science. You, you, can, you, can, you should use your medical uh, expertise on the humanitarian sector. You don't need to carry the boxes. We have a lot of uh, colleagues to carry that. You should use your expertise on the humanitarian sector. And charity is always good. No, it's not always good, but in the, in the first moments of the crisis, in the first times of the, the crisis, charity or donation or giving some in kind or uh, the, the, the cash assistance to the people is a necessity. But it, is, it should be limited for a time and we should, and all of the humanitarian programs should design their exit strategy from that, uh, that programs. And there is a discussions in the humanitarian the circles, humanitarian development axis. Uh, what is the difference between the humanitarian problems and the, uh, the development uh, programs? And there is a huge uh, interlinkage between uh, these uh, discussions. And we should we shouldn't create a, a group of people who are addicted to the assistance. And we should help them to to build their own lives. And all of the humanitarian projects should uh, aim uh, that outcome actually. I think uh, we have some limitation. This so I, I think there are two, uh, two questions about uh, fake news. So yes, fake news is a big problem. Fake news happens sometimes because it's fact, but it's not the only reason. We have to have the proper definition for fake news. We, we are not considering the sloppy journalism, for example, or people who are not real journalists. We, we, when we say fake news, the, the main problem, 90% uh, of the problem, these are like organizations um, and the definition of it is the mobilization of media bias. So these are people working 24 hours, seven. They are paid to circulate fake news and, and, and they generally work for higher uh, institutions or, or uh, even governments in order to uh, either create uh, some, some disorder or create some uh, certain movements of population or uh, try to weaken certain societies. So uh, the problem is higher than just like being fast Fast is one problem, but it can be a source of sloppy journalism that can be corrected later. So for example, we have many instances where uh, CNN did a mistake or, or, or, or France 24 did a mistake, but they will come back and say they rectified, they will say sorry, we did, we did say so, but it was not uh, accurate. The problem of fake news is, is deeper, is, is more problematic, and it has a lot of people behind, lot of organization, lot of money being circulated. And if you want to just have a, an idea about it, read more about uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal in, in, in the UK uh, and in the US and how they, for example, the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, elections in the United States presidential elections were driven by a, a flood of fake news and same thing for Brexit. So these things need to be taken more in consideration. For your question, how policy making can deal with that. I think there, there are some uh, legislations being introduced in order to uh, counter check uh, uh, this fake news, but I think uh, awareness and uh, especially in media and journalism uh, institutions should be, uh, should let they learn more about the problem and, and uh, correctly identify the problem. And also there in, at the level of uh, media organization like ourselves, we have fact checkers. So we have fact checkers whenever there's like a uh, kind of uh, news that is not, uh, not really uh, uh, adequate or not really information, it's fake news. We have fact checkers and there are organizations, even big organizations working on fact checking, like everything you need to fact check in order to find if it's real or, or, or not real. Yeah. Finally, to your uh, uh, questions from the lady from Iraq, um, you know, for, for moving forward, I, I, I advised about having focus, an area of focus for research. So don't be a uh, jack of all trade. Try to be more specific, narrow down uh, the specificity. Have more uh, software and knowledge about like data, how to crunch the data, how to analyze data. This is very important because unfortunately not every education system is actually 
um, producing researchers that are up to, uh, up to date in order to how to analyze, and especially quantitative research. Don't go for qualitative research, I mean, or go very, very few, fewer than, than what you do for, uh, for quantitative research. And last but not least, be adaptable, flexible. You, you are going to do a lot of things that are not necessarily related to research. So you have to have this mindset of being a, a, a team player rather than being centered on, on your cell phone. Okay, Mr. Uh, I just want to wrap up uh, generally in a comment. The sister who was uh, asking about f fake news and speed, is it better to be slow? And the issue of education. Uh, I just want to put this into context here that um, it comes down to skill. First of all, with the uh, fake news issue, a trained journalist is um, trained obviously to see something that looks suspicious and it, it's just critical thinking, like does this make sense or not? India tweeted that they found a cure to uh, uh, the coronavirus as the WHO still hadn't even like mentioned something yet about it. So it's, it's, it's common sense. But critical thinking is a skill that you can develop in yourself. That said, I do not think it's a dichotomy um, that speed and quality don't go hand in hand. And that leads me to my next point. Um, to the youth sitting in this room, you have nearly 400, 450 million um, youth in the OIC region alone. And just sitting in this room now, look around you, you're surrounded by people from every single country. So there is a lot of transference, there are people from different countries. The market competition is fierce, actually, and it will only get more fierce over the years. Um, so instead of focusing on the basics and what your education teaches you, as Dr. Lara said, go above and beyond because there are already too many qualitative researchers there are too many journalists, and in this job market, and it's only going to get worse from here, um, you need more distinguished, distinct people that are willing to go above and beyond, fuse ideas, create new ideas, um, disrupt industries even, to f create jobs for themselves. And um, ultimately, the age-old questions that we're focusing on now of, uh, how do I find a job? Do you guys have openings for this? Again and again, I feel like we have to say this multiple times because you're going to realize it when you leave universities or, or you, you endure the hunt for a job later on. Um, it's not going to really help as much as sitting now with yourself and being realistic and looking at the top paying jobs, looking at the most demanded jobs and looking at what you study and saying to yourself, how can I go from here to there? What's my, what's my road plan? What's my action plan? And I, I genuinely urge all of you to sit down and, and do this as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, and now we come to the end of our panel. I would like to thank all, the, all of our panelists uh, for sharing your expertise with us. I would like to thank you, uh, all participants, and I would like to thank the host organization and the co-organizers. And I believe we will see each other afternoon in the panel. And there is a little yeah, token of appreciation to our panelists. And, uh, thank you very much. For the thank you very much.